And so, Father, today we thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. We have sensed in such a powerful way through the worship today. God, we are thankful that the battle is not ours, but the battle is yours. You have promised to fight on our behalf. And Lord, today I just ask that you would anoint your servant, that I may declare the truth of your word without compromise. Father, I pray today that you would help me to speak clearly. I pray that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God would say. Give us a receptive heart. And God, I bind every spirit that's not of you that would come to steal the word, the seed of the word of God from our hearts. God, let it fall on good soil. Let it produce. Let it make us into the image of Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning I want you to journey with me into what is arguably one of the most beloved instances in the life of Jesus. And as you turn to the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John, you may be surprised that one of the most beloved passages in all the Bible, uh, it's not a recorded instance of a miracle that is performed. Now, there's some great things that happen in the Gospel of John. Uh, in the Gospel of John, 5,000 are fed. Uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus walks on water. Uh, water is turned to wine. Lazarus is raised from the dead. But I would argue to you that the most beloved occurrence in the life of Jesus, according to the Gospel of John, as we read in the 8th chapter, is not a miracle performed, but rather it's mercy that is presented. So I want you to join me as we read from the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John. passage is well known uh, to just about any of us that have been in church for any amount of time. But John chapter 8, we're going to begin reading in verse number 2. Uh, I'll read from the New King James Version this morning, and here's how it reads. Now early in the morning he, meaning Jesus, came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, <clears throat> this woman was called in adultery in the very act. And now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Because sometimes you've got to ignore foolishness. Oh, that's not in your Bible? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, <clears throat> but have the light of life. Uh, do me a favor. I need you to be a preacher for just a moment. I need you to look at your neighbor and give them today's sermon title. Tell them, neighbor, oh neighbor, put that down. Put that down. <laughs> now by this time, 
Jesus, when he gets to Jerusalem, his popularity is on the rise. And the Bible teaches us that he enters the temple and almost all of Jerusalem gathers together to hear him. Because by this point in the 8th chapter of the life of Jesus, according to the gospel writer of John, some great things have already happened. Word, word is out that Jesus has turned water into wine, it, it, and it only gets better from here. The centurion has spread word that Jesus has healed his son, even though the centurion was not a Jew. Word is spread that there was a man who was sick by the pool of Bethesda for 30 and 8 years, and at the word of Jesus, he was made whole. 5,000 folks are witness to the power of Jesus as he was able to take some sardines and biscuits and bless everybody with leftovers. And there's a rumor out that Jesus even walks on water. So it's no surprise that by the time he gets to Jerusalem and enters the temple, a crowd has gathered together. Overflow is filled. Uh, people are watching online. Uh, everybody's gathered together to hear and to see this man who's done such great things. Just about everybody believes that he is who he says he is, except for a small group who continues to reject his claim to be the Messiah. You know them. They are the Pharisees and their sidekick, the scribes. These Pharisees and their affiliates named the scribes have issue with Jesus because it seems that every turn Jesus has openly questioned them. And they've criticized Jesus and they've tried to make him to be someone other than who he really is. But you know, Jesus, just being Jesus, not meaning to, but speaking the truth, humiliates them in front of the crowds. He has poked holes in their systematic theology. He has unveiled the hypocrisy of their religiosity. These Pharisees and scribes have issue with Jesus. Because he's always made them seem silly in the eyes of the people. But not today. Today is the day that the Pharisees and the scribes will finally get back at Jesus. They know Jesus in the, is in the temple. Uh, Linda, they have come up with what they believe is the perfect plan to turn the tables. Jesus has questioned us, but today we're going to get him. Today the tables are turned. So while Jesus is there in the temple teaching, these Pharisees and their sidekick affiliates, the scribes, have gone out into town and found a woman in the midst of an adulterous act. Now, let me just say, this is not children's church. This morning, the kids are out in the kids' building. We're all grown-ups. And what I want to say is, when you think about this situation, in order for them to bring this woman, they barge into a bedroom of adults committing adultery. And they snatched the woman out of bed. Don't know what happened to the man, if he ran or if he got a pass, but they were after her. And don't be so holy that you miss how this goes down. She does not have time to put on her makeup. She does not have time to fix her hair. She doesn't even have time to put her clothes back on. They snatch her out of bed. Religious folks 
She grabs whatever bit of blanket or towel she can to cover herself. And these religious folks snatch a half-naked woman out of bed and drag her through the streets of Jerusalem, take her to the house of God, throw her down in front of Jesus. She's been snatched out of bed, humiliated through the streets of Jerusalem by religious folks who take her to the temple, and now she finds out that the worst has yet to happen because when they throw her down, this is what they say. Jesus, the laws of Moses say this woman ought to be stoned. And to her surprise, this group of religious folk have now picked up stones. And they're looking at Jesus saying, we got him now. What you going to do, Jesus? Because you only have two options. You either have to violate the law of Moses, which proves you are not the Messiah, or you have to authorize us stoning her, which will cause the people not to love you anymore. We got him. And all we had to do was snatch a sister out of bed humiliate her, throw her down in front of the religious people. And we got Jesus right where we want him. Lord, what you going to do? And the Bible says Jesus exercises a third option. He begins writing on the ground. Now, you've got to understand, this. even this, once again, was Jesus' way of subtly disrespecting the Pharisees and the scribes by suggesting, I am not going to deal with your foolishness. I am ignoring you because that's really all I have to do. But these Pharisees and their affiliates, the scribes, won't let it go. You ever found some folks in life who just won't let it go? Just won't let it go. Jesus, we know you hear us. What do you say? Violate the law or stone her? And Jesus just keeps writing on the ground. They push it again. Hey, you hear us. Stone her or violate the law. And Jesus stops and says one of the most beloved and famous sentences in all of Scripture. He that is without sin, you throw the first stone. You know what Jesus, in essence, is saying to this crowd that wants this woman killed? Put that down. That rock that you're about to throw, put that down. That judgment that you're about to pass, put that down. That name that you're about to call her, put that down. That condemnation that you're about to execute, Jesus says, put it down. He says, put it down. And he says, put it down, first of all, because watch this. Number one, nobody in this circle is qualified to judge anyone. Nobody's qualified to judge her. Jesus says, listen, I know y'all are Pharisees. I know you're scribes. I know you think you're holy. I know you memorize scripture. I know you how to get I know you know how to get to church. I know you know the religiosity of the day, but nobody in this crowd is qualified to judge. Look, there's no doubt about it. This woman is a sinner. She's caught in the very act of sin. She's caught Nobody's trying to say that what she did is right. She's in sin. 
and the Pharisees and scribes bring her to Jesus. And here's what they say. They say, let's deal with the sin issue. We caught her in sin. We want, Jesus, we want you to convict her of sin. We want you to condemn her of sin. We want you to deal with the sin that we brought to you. And Jesus says, cool. But her sin ain't the only sin that just walked in the door. Because when you brought her here, you brought her sin and you brought your sin with her. Therefore, this is what I'm going to say. Whoever is in this room that has never, ever, ever done anything wrong, never fallen short, never committed a sin, you have the right to be the first one. But if you know that you are a sinner, you have no authorization to condemn somebody else. You know what Jesus reminds them of? It's something I believe some of us need to be reminded of because we have apparently taken it out of our Bible that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have fallen short of what God's standard of righteousness is. Now, now, now can I teach a little Bible? Uh, let, me, let me tell you what happens. The law of adultery that they're referring to in Leviticus, it's in Leviticus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 22. You've got to understand this to understand the core of why this stoning had to occur, occur. You have to understand this is a patriarchal society. Patriarchal society. The law of adultery was written to protect a husband's property one of which was considered to be his wife. <clears throat> and so if another man sleeps with a husband's wife, he has violated the husband's property. Therefore, according to the law, watch this, both the woman and the man have to be stoned. So Jesus says, hold on. Y'all brought the woman... But where's the man? And here's the thing. So in order for you to have your way, you want me to condemn a woman who broke the law, but you broke the law by bringing her in here. And here's the irony. While you're condemning someone else's sin, you have committed sin in trying to condemn her of her sin. So if she got to go down, you got to go down. Can I remind you that Isaiah says in chapter 64 and verse 6 that all our righteousness is as filthy rags in the eyes of God. Which means that even when you think you're living at your religious best, your righteousness is still filthy in the eyes of God. When you're quoting scripture, when you're on your knees every day, when you're in worship on Sunday, I got news for you. You are still filthy rags in the eyes of God because none is righteous outside of the saving blood of Jesus Christ. What these Pharisees don't understand is what Jesus says to us in Matthew 7, and here it is in the David J. Edwards version. How dare you judge anybody else's sin when you got your own stuff to deal with? Can I give you today's tweet? The Bible is not meant to be a set of binoculars to help you look into the lives of others 
but rather a mirror that causes you to look at your own self. Pause, stop, hit, rid, uh, rewind, push, play. The Word of God does not authorize you to scope out and search out somebody else's issues and somebody else's sin and somebody else's faults. The Word of God is meant to be a mirror that causes you to look at your own iniquities, at your own faults, at your own sinfulness at your own iniquity, at your own unrighteousness, and deal with yourself. See, Jesus understands the problem with these Pharisees. It's a problem that exists in a lot of churches today. Is that Christianity is easy when your Christianity is compared to somebody else. Righteousness is easy when your righteousness is relative to somebody else. Holiness is easy when you create a hierarchy of holiness that allows you to condemn somebody else's sin as greater than your own. So now you can sit back and pat yourself on the back and say, well, at least I'm not like them. At least I'm not like them. But in God's eyes, there is no big sin. There is no little sin. There is no black lie. There is no white lie. A half-truth is a whole lie. And God says sin is sin. And you can't compare what you do with what others do. Because only God is the one to judge. So watch what Jesus, this is why I love Jesus. He writes on the ground. Now, Ken, when you do your homework, you're going to find there's no scholar who can tell you what Jesus wrote. I've read every commentary I could find, every Bible encyclopedia. Nobody tells what Jesus wrote. But what we do know is that whatever he wrote, convicts those who have stones in their hands and they begin to drop them and walk out the door so can I posit a possibility that Jesus started writing some other sins on the ground to remind them that adultery ain't the only one that's in the room and when I get to your sin, <laughs> drop the stone, raise your hand, and walk out of the room. Your sin may not be her sin, but trust me, yours is in the dirt somewhere. That's why he puts it in the dirt, because he wants to remind us that all of us got some dirt that we got to deal with. Touch somebody and tell them, put, put it down. Put it down. Put it down. Because you're not qualified to judge anybody. There's not a one of us in here. Don't care how holy we are. It don't, don't matter how long we've been serving Jesus. Don't matter how many times we've read the Bible through. They, there's nobody qualified to judge anybody else's sin. Now here's the second thing. and God help me. Give me strength to preach this. I know this may offend somebody, but he says, secondly, put it down because there are other issues you ought to be dealing with. See, I grew up in church. I've been in church my whole life since I was eight years old. I've been around a lot of Christians. I've been around a lot of religious people. Come on, let's get in the Bible this morning. and See, the Bible says Jesus comes to the temple, and in verse number 2, John, in his recording of Scripture, he says in that, that all the people came to see Jesus. But I, I notice 
that really all the people are there to see Jesus except for one group. Because the Pharisees aren't there to see Jesus. Instead, they're out doing something else. My issue is not that they're not in church, okay? Uh, I know there's some people can't be here today, and there's some that are shut in, and they, they're watching online, and, and hey, welcome online congregation. We're glad you're with us today. But not everybody was there with Jesus that day. There were some of them, Brother Bo. They were out doing something else. And here's my issue. My issue is what they're doing when they're not in the temple. Because when they're not in the temple, they're trying to find a woman in the very act of adultery. When they're not in the house of God, they're trying to find a woman in adultery. Okay, again, children aren't in here. This is not children's church, so... I could do a little PG-13 here. They are looking for a woman in the act of adultery. Religious folk. And in order to catch a woman in the act of adultery, they literally have to peek in bedrooms. Come on, somebody. So they're outside the temple... And they got nothing better to do than to peek into bedrooms. We're talking about the religious folk peeking into bedrooms. Trying to find somebody in the act of adultery. Religious folks. They're not trying to feed the hungry. They're peeking. They're not concerned about the widows and the orphans. They're peeking. Uh, they, 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 they're not out witnessing and, and, and telling people they need to get right with God and surrender to Jesus Christ. No, they're peeking. They're not making disciples. They're not maturing the saints. They're peeking. They're not even addressing the oppression of the Roman Empire over the Jewish nation. They got nothing better to do than peek in bedrooms. Now, I want you to understand why this is important. Because God has given us, as His people, a mandate and a job description of what we're to be about. We're here to help each other. We're here to love one another. We're to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And our, our neighbor as we love ourselves. We're to be a light in a dark world. Stay with me. Hear me out. There are some issues that you and I may never agree on, but it doesn't mean we have to be spiteful and hateful and vindictive uh, we should still call sin, sin. Uh, we should still call wrong, wrong. We should still call what's right, right. Okay? Uh, I'm not saying compromise, but I'm telling you this, church. We should never take matters into our, our own hands when it comes to exposing or condemning or judging because God says he hates the sin, but he loves the person that's doing the sin. He's a God of redemption. He's a God of a second chance. Is there anybody here glad that God loved you even when you were in your sin? Even when you were in your sin. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and gave himself that we could be forgiven. And here's what I want all of us to know, is that this church, I'm not concerned about other churches, but this church, Calvary Assembly of God, has more to do 
than trying to find out who's doing right and who's doing wrong. We are here to love our neighbor. We are here to love our God. We are here to win the lost. We are here to make disciples. That should be our biggest issue. Not who's doing this and who's doing that and who's not doing this and who's not doing that. Church, our community needs Jesus. Violence is out of control. In Tillman's Corner, Alabama, drugs and alcohol abuse are rampant. There are 600 families in Mobile, Alabama that are homeless today. And in these cold temperatures, they better go to a shelter to stay warm. But 25%, one out of four citizens in our county lives below the poverty level. That means last year, last year, 41,000 people in Mobile County living in poverty. And we got more to do than to peek into bedrooms. We got more to do than to point a finger at other people and accuse them. We better do the work of God. We better get our hind ends out of the seat and out into the street and tell people about Jesus. Let me tell you, church, we're going to be held accountable one day. What did you do? What did this church do to outreach to, to the people in this community? Are we so content that we're just satisfied with a Sunday morning service from 10 to 12, 10.30 to 12, and that's all church is? Maybe throw in a Wednesday night here and there. Is that all church is? No, listen, we're here. We're a hospital. There are hurting people out there. We ought to bring them in. We ought to minister to them. We ought to love them. We ought to see them come to know Jesus, have their sins forgiven. Let them grow in the Word of God. Let them become all that God has created them to be. Well, Pastor, that's your job. We pay you to go out and win the lost. That's a big negative. That's a big zilch. That's a big zero. I don't win people because I'm a pastor. I win people because I'm a Christian. And you are too also. You have an opportunity. You have probably more opportunities to witness to people than I do. You have people on your job. You have people in the grocery store. You have people your neighbors. You have people in school. You have people everywhere that you can live the life. And if you're always going out and talking about how bad the church is, they ain't coming to Jesus. If you're always going out and saying, I don't like the song they sung Sunday morning, they're not coming to If you get on there and say, well, I wish we'd sing this kind of music instead of that kind of music, you're gonna, you ain't winning nobody to Jesus that way. I don't like the preacher. I don't like what he preaches. I don't like the way he dresses. I don't like the way he wears his hair. I don't like the fact that he, he didn't come to my birthday party. I'll tell you, church, we got, listen, time is short. Look around. Look at the sign. Look at this volcano that just blew to pieces yesterday. Sent a tsunami to the, to the West Coast and to, to Australia and other. Listen, Jesus is coming soon. We don't have time to play around. We got a job. We got a mandate. We got a mission to win the lost this year, this year. This, this month, <laughs> church, do me a favor. Nudge somebody and say, don't be a Pharisee. Come on, don't be a Pharisee. Because Pharisees ain't got nothing better to do than to peek in bedrooms. We have people that are hurting, hurting, hurting. In this church and even outside, listen, all we want to do is throw stones. All we want to do is criticize. All we want to do is find fault. All we want to do is make excuses. We just want to throw that rock. Let me just throw that stone. Put it down. Put it down. Thought it was a real rock, didn't you? Kind of looked like it, but it's a paper towel. I didn't want to tear the platform up. I thought I might throw it at some one of y'all, but... Uh, 
But no, listen, put it down. Because we got other issues to deal with. And then Jesus says, finally, put it down. Because stoning her is not on my agenda. It, here is a, a lady caught in sin. No doubt about it. No doubt it, she's caught in sin. The question this passage raises that's critical for the body of Christ is what is our responsibility to those caught in sin? We don't talk about this a lot, but, but, but what are we obligated to do for those who have fallen in their walk with the Lord? What should you do when you know there's a brother or sister who's not living up to the will of God. What is God's assignment on your life? You search scripture, you're never called to judge. You're never called to condemn. You're never called to expose. Here's what the Bible says. I want you to read it when you get home. I promise you it's right there. Galatians 6. If a brother be overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one with a spirit of gentleness. Write those words down. Spiritual, restore, and gentleness. Which means half the folks in church have no business dealing with anybody who's fallen in sin. Because the Bible says in order to deal with it, number one, you've got to be spiritual. That just disqualified a bunch of church folks who call themselves Christian. See, you, you have to seek to restore. Everybody say restore. Restore. You've got to seek to restore. And... You have to do it with gentleness. Anything else disqualifies you from dealing with it. So let me tell you why the Pharisees have no business dealing with this woman's sin. Because remember, they catch her in the act of adultery. Now in order to catch her in the act of adultery, they have to know who she is, they have to know who she's with. They have to know the location where to catch her. They have to know the time when it's going to happen. Now, how do you know all that? You didn't just find that out. You've known this for a while. But you never have done anything to help her. They did not care about this woman until she served their purpose. Their motive was not to restore her, but to embarrass her. See, I don't need people around me who see me slipping and don't intervene. I don't need people around me that don't see me slipping and don't pray for me and don't try to help me. And don't try and don't intercede. Now, the one thing that the Pharisees did do that was right, they brought her to Jesus. Church, let me tell you, that really is where your assignment ends. You bring them to Jesus. I tell you, great things happen when you lay people at the feet of Jesus. Great things happen when you pray and you cast people into the care of Jesus. Great things happen when you trust the Lord in prayer to deal with a brother or a sister who has fallen short of the will of God. When you pray, great things happen. But here's where they went wrong. They bring her to, to Jesus. They're in the temple. They're Pharisees. They're religious folks in the temple with Jesus. And the deepest desire of their heart for her was that she be stoned. That's the deepest desire. 
Let's, 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 let's stone her. Now, now, notice, see the scenario. Religious folks in the house of God, in the presence of the Master, and within their heart, their deepest desire is for this lady to be stoned. What is wrong with this picture? People who say they love the Lord and worship in the house of God, and yet they have a heart filled with malice and wrath. So Jesus says to them, put that down. Because when you bring her to me, Jesus says, when you bring her to me, my agenda for her is life. It's not to stone her. Because God did not send me into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. So here's the question, Pharisees, scribes. What do you think God's agenda for the sinner is? Too deep, too deep. Where does God get greater glory? In a sinner who is stoned or a sinner who is saved? Jesus said to them, look, if you're bringing her to me, you need to know that my agenda is not to judge her, but to justify her. Not to condemn her, but to convert her. Not to harm her, but to help her. Anybody can throw stones. Anybody can judge. Anybody can condemn. But only a gracious Lord and a merciful Master can look beyond our faults and see our needs and change our life and take a black heart full of sin and wash it with a, white, with a red blood and make it as white as snow. So saints, can I tell you that I was wrong in the introduction to this sermon because I told you that John 8 there was no miracle yes it was greater than walking on water greater than turning water into wine is the miracle of salvation <laughs> where sinners are saved where those who are wrong are made right. Where those who are caught in the act walk out righteous. That's the greatest miracle of God. That God is able to take sinners like you, like me, and able to turn our lives around. Give up unrighteousness and walk away from iniquity. And move in the words of Jesus to go and sin no more. So the Lord tells them, drop their stones. They walk away. And when Jesus looks up, it's just him and her. Because that's where salvation begins. Not in a condemning crowd, but in those private moments with the Lord. Nothing will change your life more than a private moment with Jesus. You don't have to be in a church full of people to give your heart to Christ. You can do it anywhere. And sometimes I think it's better to do it in a private moment where it's just you and Jesus. And you get real with God. Because he knows you anyway. He knows the thoughts and the intents of your heart. He knows the motives. He knows everything you've ever done, ever said, ever thought, ever imagined. He knows. And so nothing will change your life more. And as it's just Jesus and her, he says to her, listen. I said to them that the only person who could throw a stone 
was one who had not sinned. Which meant that in that whole room, there was only one person who could throw a stone. And that was Jesus. Jesus has never sinned one time in his whole life. And Jesus, who had never sinned, the one who was the only one authorized to throw a stone looked at her and said, I don't condemn you. <laughs> now, if the Lord does it, what makes you think you can? If the Lord does it, Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, 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 I, I, I do my homework, okay? I did my homework before I came because a lot of scholars wonder, did she do it again? <laughs> because that's our question. Here it is, because in the body of Christ, one of the most damaging spirits are those who question the authenticity of someone's repentance. Come on, Pastor. Come on. Come on. We see people who are repentant, repentant, they're sorrowful, but we doubt it because we wonder, are they going to do it again? You never see this woman in Scripture again. We don't know. And there's a reason why. Because what the Lord is saying is, He's saying it's none of your business. Now, I know you can't clap. You can't clap. Because you've got a sanctified private investigator badge. But the emphasis is, stop following her. Stop trying to figure out what she's doing. Stop trailing her. And start dealing with you. Getting your life right with God. Getting your walk right with God. Somebody say, put it down. Put that down. Put that down. Put down your judgment. Put down your self-righteousness. Put down your pride. Put down your, your, your criticism, your condemnation. Put it down. Put it down and focus on you. Look in the mirror and say, It's me, O oh Lord. I'm the one standing in the need of prayer. God says, I'll deal with the sinner. God says, I'll deal with the sinner. But we better make sure that we let him deal with us first. Father God, we thank you today. We thank you for how you, God, you revealed to us your great love for even the sinner, Lord. God, through this story, we, we see love in action. God, we see what it means to come to a Savior just as we are. This morning with heads bowed and eyes closed. I love the song that they used to sing and play at the end of every Billy Graham crusade. Just as I am without one plea. But that thou, Lord, has died for me. When we come to Christ, he doesn't tell us to clean up our act before we come to him. There is absolutely nothing you can do to earn God's favor. There's nothing you can do to clean up your sin. Only Jesus can clean up your sin. Only Jesus can make you whole. With eyes closed, heads bowed, no one looking around. This morning, if you're, if you're here in this sanctuary, if you're watching online, this morning, 
through this message, the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. Maybe you've been looking at everybody else's sin, and God's saying it's time for you to look at your own. See, one day we're going to stand before Jesus Christ. When I stand before Christ, I'm not going to have to answer for anybody else's sin. He's not going to say, well, what about so-and-so? And what about this and that? And he's going to say, well, what about you? What did you, what did you do? So with heads bowed and eyes closed, my question this morning is, where are you with Jesus? Where are you today? Nobody's here to judge you. Nobody's here to condemn you. Jesus is here to save you. He's here to love you. I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to serve a God like that. <laughs> if you'd be honest and you'd say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not where I need to be with Christ. There's things in my life I need to get right with God. I want you to lift your hand right now. Yes. Just lift it up. Hold it up. So I acknowledge, yes, thank you, thank you. Are there others? Come on, lift it up. Say, I'm not where I need to be with Jesus. Are there any here today? Yes, thank you, yes. Come on, just lift it up. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. Jesus is here to save you. He's here to love you. He's here to forgive you. That's why he came. He said, I've come to give my life as a ransom. I've come to give my life you can be forgiven. Are there others today? You're not where you need to be with Jesus. Just lift it up. And say, pray for me, Pastor. Today, I want Jesus to save me. I want to be like this lady that was caught in the very act. How humiliating, how embarrassing, how fearful. And Jesus said, put that down. Put it down. You have no right. You're not qualified. That's not my agenda. There's other issues you need to deal with. Can we all stand together? Now here's our homework. This week, instead of going out and finding somebody in sin and trying to condemn them and tell them you're going to hell if you don't get right with God, you know, that's not the way to win somebody to Jesus. Uh, some, be, some people, they just don't have any wisdom. You don't win anybody by saying, you're going to bust hell wide open if you don't get right with God. That, that's not the way to, to love people into the kingdom. Okay. Jesus, what did we say? He that is spiritual restores such a one that has fallen with gentleness. The old folks used to say it like this. You're going to win more with honey than vinegar. Is that right, vinegar? You're going to love more people by loving them in the kingdom than you are trying to condemn them and pound them and tell them how wrong they are. Love them into the kingdom. Love them into, Christ, into a relationship with Christ. And you're not responsible for whether they come to God or not. Only they are responsible. But you are responsible for telling them if we don't tell them, we're going to help be held accountable. Can we all just pray this prayer together? Lord Jesus, I thank you for your great love. I admit that like this lady, God, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Lord, I'm sorry for all my sin and all my unrighteousness. I believe you love me. You went to the cross. You died. You shed your blood in my place. You were the sacrificial lamb for my sins. I believe you were buried in a tomb. But three days later, you came out of that tomb, signifying, proving to the world that your sacrifice was acceptable to our Father God. Today, Lord, I come just as I am. You know everything about me. 
You know my past. You know my present. You even know my future. I throw myself at your feet, Lord. I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness. I surrender. I give everything to you. I give you my life. I thank you for yours. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me a child of God. Let me please you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's praise the Lord for his salvation today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God bless you. We love you. Thank you.